Annie Fox. Welcome to Tech Talk with Daniel. Thank you so much for inviting me. You know, I'm particularly excited about this conversation because in addition to the fact that you worked on some of the games I played as a kid, you also worked on some of the games that my children have played in recent years. <laughs> How about that? You stick around long enough <laughs> and you hit everybody. <laughs> But let's start at the beginning. How did you get into game design? Um, well, I have to go back a little bit before that. And it is, how did I get into working with computers? If mm -hmm. you knew me um, in my 20s, you would probably guess I was the least likely person to choose <laughs> to work with computers. I was um, always, I've always been a writer. So, um, Pen and paper were kind of my thing, keeping journals, drawing, uh, writing poetry, being out in nature. Um, technology was just not part of the mix. And then I met David Fox. And um, he was a tech guy even before he worked with computers. When I first met him, which was 50 years ago, last month, um, I was vacationing in San Francisco from my home in upstate New York, and David lived here. He was selling video equipment for a company called Panasonic, and had always had a love of um, editing video, making movies, things like that. And and when I um, and David and I got together, which was on that same vacation, we decided, okay, we had found the right person for each other. Um, we got an idea a couple of years after that, that we should open a public access microcomputer center. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to do there? And he says, Annie, you're a teacher. You're going to teach the kids how to program. And I thought, okay, really? In, in what, on what planet is that going to happen? David says, I'll teach you and you'll teach the kids. Which is exactly what happened. So I say that the game design came first with me being dragged, kicking and screaming into the computer age. Mind you, this was 1977 we're talking about. And um, because of David's patience in teaching me, I was then able to take the perspective of someone who at first knew nothing, which was pretty much the profile of the people who came to my classes. And um, because of that empathy, I was able to make learning computers, programming, simple programming, um, comfortable and non-threatening. I'm pretty non-threatening. <laughs> and so our first client was Children's Television Workshop, the Sesame Street people. And they approached us and asked us to create what they were calling a mix and match Muppets game for a Sesame Street theme park outside of Philadelphia. And so we were then game designers. That's how it, that's how it happened. Now, I want to show you a clip from that period of time. Okay. We'll discuss that clip immediately afterwards. <laughs> David and Annie Fox pioneered another way to learn to use computers. In 1977, they founded the Marin Computer Center north of San Francisco. It's a public access center where anyone can come in and use the computers. Okay, take as much time as you need to have a really good story. Some people who are working on the safari. Um, it's a place where people can come in and play with computers in a real friendly, low key environment. We essentially rent computer time by the hour for game playing and educational use, and we teach programming to kids and adults. The underall um, purpose of everything that we do here is to give a child an experience of power over what he formerly thought was an extremely powerful machine. Putting the child in the driver's seat, making him aware of the computer's capabilities as well as limitations, gives him a feeling that, hey, you know, I'm eight years old and I can tell this machine what to do. I think that they're a great motivator. Because to be a programmer, you have to be a teacher. And in order for a child to take on the role of a teacher, the child has to really know his material really well. And it kind of puts him on the other side. Instead of always receiving the information, 
he's now inputting information into a computer, and the computer becomes a student. That feeling of confidence, if you can have a feeling of power over a computer, then, then the child feels there's nothing that he cannot do. There are people in their um, late 30s and 40s and older who uh, feel the computers have just passed them by. And uh, that's difficult because a lot of them are now dealing with them on a professional level because the computers are everywhere. I've learned that anybody can learn anything. And I use myself as an example because I was scared to death of computers. I was not good in math and I hated technology per se. And for me to be a proponent of this stuff makes me realize that really anybody can learn on whatever level they want to get into it. And it's fun. I've learned computers are fun. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you make a compelling argument. <laughs> Sounds like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the interesting part is I wanted to know whether or not children were actually eager at the time to learn programming because I learned programming as a kid, but I learned it in the 90s. And so personal computers were readily available to have at home. But over here, it was just like going to the library and learning to program. Yeah. And every time you'd want to program something, you'd have to go to the library. So well, yeah. were, um, were children eager to learn at the time, especially sub the subject of computer programming? Yes. You see, I think um, games were the hook. We, we had a library of games. And so that was probably the first interaction a lot of these kids had with computers and a lot of adults as well. So we were already putting them on a, a pretty comfortable footing. Also, this place, this Marin Computer Center was a, public, a defunct public school in the middle of a large neighborhood. So it was a very residential area. Kids rode their bikes and walked there. Um, it was a place that was well lit. And um, me and David were there. Um, we had a dog. You saw our little daughter was there. Um, it, was, it was a very friendly place. So um, when we first opened our doors, I wrote a little press release and 700 people showed up. <laughs> and they were mostly kids leading fearful adults <laughs> by the hand through the doors of this place. We were not selling computers. We were just inviting people to play. And yeah, they were really eager. Um, one of the neighbors there was probably, um, he was a software engineer, developed a programming language called Pilot. I don't remember what the acronym started uh, stood for, but it was quite simple and a, a lot of the kids took to it very, very easily and just loved the idea of being able to tell the computer, ask me my name. Okay, what is your name? And then wait for an answer and then you put it in and then the computer says, hi, Daniel, how are you? And everyone was just delighted. And it was like, whoa. And from there, they thought, whoa, maybe I could get it to ask more questions. And it, it, it just, well, you know how it is. It's just kind of fun. And when you wrote the syllabus and, and lesson materials, how did you ensure that the kids would stay engaged, especially considering the, the unforgiving nature of computer programming at the time? I'm a teacher. So um, the fact that David taught me helped me understand what it takes to understand this stuff. And I, if I have a superpower, it's talking to kids and, and writing for kids. So it was quite easy and natural for me to create an eight-week course for children that would take them step-by-step step through some simple commands and then to give them some fun, creative assignments so that they could then play around with the computer and see what they could do and make it, make it do for them. And the sharing of it and the, um, the ripple effect of learning in those kinds of environments. They, we, had, we were in what used to be a multi-purpose room or library. And so there were study carols there and we had the computers set up. And so the students were quite close to each other. And so they could easily just stand up and look at someone else's screen and say, how did you get it to do that? And then they would show the code behind it and go, oh, wow, I'm going to try that. So it's very much a collaborative kind of learning experience. The kids loved it. And I loved being there because 
as I said in that ancient piece of video, um, <laughs> if I could learn this, anybody could learn it. <laughs> and I really believe that. It's not that ancient. It's from 1982. 1982 <laughs> was like 20 years ago, or at least I want to believe <laughs> that it was. Well, it was a trip seeing our daughter because <laughs> she's definitely all grown up. <laughs> And this is the Computer Center brochure over yes. here. Yes, look at that. Look at the directions. So you take Highway 101 to Paradise Drive, <laughs> and, it's, and you get to the Gamma Building. Yeah, there we are. And um, actually, that place still exists. I went up there a couple of years ago. The Computer Center is not there anymore. but um, <clears throat> And the front of the building had changed. But it definitely was um, nostalgic for me. Because we spent we spent three years there quite intensely um, building this refuge for people, but also um, a comfortable learning environment, and we had good times, and it was nice. <laughs> now, moving on to 1988. In 1988, the game Zach McRacken and the Alien Mindbenders was released, and even though you're not credited on it. The character of Annie Laris mm -hmm. is based and named yeah. after you. That's right. <laughs> when were you first made aware that there'd be a character named Annie in the game? <laughs> Probably from the beginning. Um, I think at the time, um, Ron Gilbert and David and whoever else was working, it was Dave working on that. Uh, forgive me if I'm getting that wrong. But everybody was... Um, that the idea was that there would be... Um, some partners for the characters in the game and that the partners' names would be taken from real-life romantic partners. So I was fine with that. Now, moving on to an actual credit of yours, in 1991, <laughs> you got your first game credit on Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Ooh, for writing dialogue hard. and story. <laughs> now, Ooh. when people think about the early days of FMV games, the, the seventh guest often takes the spotlight, but Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective was released two years prior to that, which means that you were trailblazers in the domain of interactive FMV storytelling. So, first of all, I have a copy of the game over here. <laughs> and this is a first for me because that's my first FMV game, the first one I actually played on my newly bought at the time CD-ROM drive. And it was mind blowing having full motion video on your computer. That's like witchcraft. <laughs> so, how did you approach the writing of the story given that you had to handle the interactive aspects, yeah. the player choices, and the limitations of the CD ROM drives of the time? That project was really interesting. Um, Lori Bauman Arnold and I um, co-wrote the script. And she and I met because, <clears throat> excuse me, her husband, Steve Arnold, was the head of the computer games division at LucasArts. And so um, we met each other and she had a background in industrial videos, in-house training videos for companies. That was her background. And so she knew about branching stuff. And um, she connected with me socially. And then the people who were behind Sherlock Holmes, was ICOM Simulations, called her up and said, hey, Lori, we've got this idea of an interactive video game. It's not been done before, but there's a lot of interactive writing going on here and um, there may be 30 plus characters, you might, we'd like you to do it. You want to bring anybody else on? And Lori called me up literally and she said, would you like to script some characters for me for a game? And I said, wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. So we did that <laughs> and we didn't we didn't direct the the actors, um, but the idea of plotting out a Sherlock Holmes story, and I was never a Sherlock Holmes, you know, fan, but the idea of mysteries has always intrigued me and planting clues and giving people a little bit of information. I love the whole premise of the game that you are in fact someone who goes along 
as a helper of Dr. Watson, and you're going to be knocking on doors and and briefly interviewing potential witnesses or some people who can give you uh, information about this case that you're about to solve. I love dialogue. I love dialect. And the idea of knocking on someone's door and having someone in costume, I could I imagined it first saying, Hello, ducky, how are you doing? What do I do for you to die? And I'm like, oh, oh, this is so much fun. This is like improvisation. I I can I can make up any characters I want. Just give them a little bit of information. Or maybe she's someone who slams the door in Dr. Watson's face and and you know, there's no information to go. But we had so much creative autonomy here that Lori and I just had so much fun. I think there were two, maybe three volumes of it. I'm not sure. But um, mm. there, yeah, there were different cases and um, just a plethora of characters to just be creative with. It was a ton of fun. And I think that the um, the actors were part of a Shakespearean company out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and if you watch, I mean, you say full motion video, you're being kind, Daniel. I mean, people would like move their hand a little bit. <laughs> they weren't walking across the stage, <laughs> but it was fun to do the scripting and it was very gratifying for me. And I thought, whoa, okay, seeing something that I had concocted, there's my joke coming out of someone's mouth and I'm still laughing. Um, it's like, well, okay, this is what I want to do. It's interesting that at the time they'd hire actors with theater background yes. for these FMV games because the resolution was so low that they had to be very expressive. And that's not something that you get from actors who act in films or TV, where yeah. you have to be more subtle. Yeah. People in theater tend to be more expressive, so they hire people from theater. It was the same thing for The Seventh Guest. Everyone's overacting <laughs> deliberately. So that that game kind of launched Lori and I into um, a career that lasted. We worked together for about ten years on many CD-ROM scripts. We did. We would deliver the script, and then the producers would hand it to the programmers and the animators, and we were pretty much out of the picture after we handed over our interactive script. And we would, we would see the final product when it came in a box to our door, and then you'd pop it into your computer and go, ha, <laughs> how about that? So you didn't get to collaborate with the cast in order to help them capture <laughs> the essence of the story? Well, there, was no, there was no cast at that point. It was mm. like putt-putt, it was animation. Um, for many of the companies, they felt it was not efficient to talk to the game designers. They just wanted to get the thing out the door. And game designers tend to say, well, wait a minute, um, this could be better. Let's, let's pull back a little bit. Let's redo this. Let's rethink this problem. It was all branching and it was, you know, um, it was an adventure game that, Everything was chained and and led from one thing to another, though you could go in different directions at once. I I actually had a situation with a game. Um, we did two Madeline games based on the very popular children's book series. And when the finished game came out, Lori and I were pretty much appalled because it's like, wait a minute, what happened to act two? What did they do? They completely cut out things so that from our perspective, that that chaining quality of one clue leading to another was gone. It it made little sense. What you gonna do? <laughs> Except produce your own so, games. <laughs> in Sherlock Holmes what were some of the most memorable challenges you faced in this project, given that it was your first official game project? And how did this shape your approach to storytelling in subsequent projects? Well, the idea of, some, of a story not being within certain boundaries, that a path can go in many different directions and the story unfolds in a different way 
for the reader or the player. Um, that just fascinated me. I just love this idea that A doesn't necessarily lead to B to C. You know, A could go off to G and then maybe loop back at some point to B. Um, and so that was a new way of thinking for me, but I took to it very readily because I'm not a very linear person. <laughs> so it was almost as if I had found a medium that was going to work really well for my style of storytelling. Now, in 1992, you were credited for writing dialogue and story for mm -hmm. But But Joins the Parade. Yes. <laughs> what led to your participation in this project, given that it's a different company altogether from the one that created Sherlock Holmes? Yeah, very different. Um, Ron Gilbert has been a longtime friend of David and mine. Um, the guys met at LucasArts and... Um, and so when Ron went off to start Humongous Entertainment and his own company, it, it was children's games that he wanted to focus on. He called them um, junior graphic adventures. And, and so again, because Lori and I had had this Sherlock Holmes experience, um, he tapped us and said, hey, come on up to Seattle and let's spend a couple of days and we'll map out this world that Putt-Putt lives in. We've already got some of it happening and um, you guys can ride it. We'll give you a couple of months. <laughs> um, it was super, super fun. I mean, I just, I, I remember this giant piece of paper literally mapping out, okay, Putt-Putt can go here and mow the lawn. Putt-Putt can go to these neighbors and offer to deliver groceries and you can pick up coins and you need to get a car wash and you need to find a balloon. And where will you get a pet for the pet parade? Um, all of these things are just like, wow, it's more than just turning pages. It's, it's a world. Now, in adventure games, the, the writer needs to sometimes handle various player interactions with numerous objects that may not actually contribute anything to the story. Right. <laughs> but in adventure games made specifically for children, there is an expectation that virtually every object on screen should be interactable in some way. The, the expectation comes from, from the concern that if an object is not interactive, the child may think that the game is malfunctioning, which contradicts the main purpose, which is to encourage the kid to explore as much as possible. Yes, this so, is true. This is true, Daniel. So as a writer, how yeah. do you navigate and address these particular types of interactions in your creative process? Ah, this is a great question. Now, I have an undergraduate degree in human development <laughs> and family dynamics, and I also have a master's degree in education with a, with a focus on early childhood. So I know how kids learn, and I also know that while you're talking about expectations of games, this is true, um, I think many of the things that the kids saw on the screen and were able to click on were um, clickable. <laughs> But not everything mm -hmm. in the world is clickable. <laughs> and so, for example, a kid might be in a store and be drawn to a blue glass and pick it up. But another time they might see something and whatever it is they want to pick up is literally glued to the shelf. Can't be moved. So... I don't think that everything in the entire universe that we were creating needed to be interactive, nor did everything that was interactive need to be something that would solve a problem. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of a crushed, an aluminum can that Putt-Putt finds at one point, and there's a recycling mm -hmm. bin nearby. And if the player clicks on the aluminum can. It does this really cool little flip up in the air and lands in the recycling can. It doesn't go into your inventory. It's not something you use to solve a problem, but it's fun. Mm -hmm. I'm all for fun <laughs> and learning. And learning has to be fun, or otherwise it doesn't, doesn't stay with you. Still in 1992, you're credited for script development on Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Volume 2. <laughs> What can you tell us about the production of this game? I can't even remember what that one was about. <laughs> okay. Moving on, but still on the same subject. A few years ago, someone bought a couple of boxes of videotapes at the garage sale. 
And after getting the proper equipment to play these videotapes, he found that the tapes contained raw, uncut footage from the filming of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Volume 2. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, these tapes are filled with moments that usually don't see the light of day in such productions, like the bloopers or the director giving directions to the actors. So let's watch a clip. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that guy. I remember that guy. <laughs> yeah, look at that pristine quality as opposed to the highly compressed version from the yeah. 1992 CD-ROM. <laughs> and as soon as I finish with this vexatious crossword puzzle, I shall look into the matter. <laughs> I don't know. Crossword? Did I say crossword? Yeah. Is that what it sounds like? Same pickup place. Crossword. Okay, everybody crossword. hold their yeah. thought. <laughs> yeah. Same pickup. From. <coughs> Stand by. And action. Have you any evidence that the murder is related to the Treasury matter? No. I tried to convince the Chancellor that unless some new evidence turns up, it looks as if Mason's death was just another commonplace murder that the Yard can solve. Holmes always says there's nothing so unnatural as the commonplace. You learn well, Watson. Ah! <laughs> and as soon as I finish this vexatious crossword puzzle, I shall look into the matter. <laughs> One more, please. Now, am I putting the pause in the right spot? Yeah. Did I say crossword? No. Crossword. So, he can't pronounce the word yeah. crossword. This should have been part of the game. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's really funny to see that. <laughs> now, in 1993, you're credited for writing and design for Putt Putt Goes to the Moon. Now, I didn't play any of the Putt Putt games as a kid, since at the time I was already outside the target demographic for the game for the games. That said, I did get to play the Putt Putt games in recent years with my daughter, <laughs> and Putt Putt Goes to the Moon was the first point-and-click adventure game she completed on her own. Oh, good. That's sweet. That was, so, a, very, it was a very fun game. <laughs> so what can you tell us about the project? Well, it was much more ambitious in terms of the storytelling and the setting. Obviously, we're going to the moon <clears throat> and the fireworks factory. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, when, when writers are given a, a larger canvas, writers will... Imagine bigger things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so many fun things happening on the moon with, you know, the moon creatures and um, finding the, the pieces of the spaceship so you could get back. Um, it was just joyful. It was just really fun, creative stuff. Lori and I worked really well together at the time we were... Um, what year was it? 90... 1993. 93. Okay. So I had two young children, um, but we managed <laughs> to do on a very short schedule, um, get the game together and, and Ron and his team at Humongous got it out. I and mean, it wasn't like years and years in production. It's just like, okay, let's do this. And the target demographic, according to the cover art, was ages three to eight. Yeah. How do you, how do you conceive a puzzle that fits three-year-olds as well as eight-year-olds, so that neither will think it's too hard or too easy? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, again, this goes back to my superpower. <laughs> when you know how kids develop, I mean, you know, typically then you could kind of find something that's going to stretch the younger edge of the age group <clears throat> and still be fulfilling for the older kids. We also had what we call repeatable play things that were kind of off the beaten path of solving the, the puzzle, but they were just fun, like little arcade games or, you know, things... Um, Oh, I think if I'm remembering correctly, there's some kind of cantina um, where you're mixing drinks in different colors. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, it has been a while and I, I don't play this game all the time, but I remember that. So this is the kind of a color exploration and just, just having fun. We tried to randomize the, um, responses some of the stationary characters would give to the players. So you didn't hear the same thing all the time. Um, I have two grandchildren at this point. One's in kindergarten and one is in fourth grade. And you're right. I mean, it can be really challenging to find that sweet spot. But um, I think if something is well designed, then you can you can get there. Also, I would probably expect that a three-year-old, this is what I thought at the time, a three-year-old would be playing with a parent or with an older sibling. And so there would be kind of a built-in hint and support system there. And the interesting part is that I played the game for the first time two years ago, and I found it more challenging than games that come out nowadays really? for adults. Oh, interesting. Because there's a lot of hand-holding in games that are released nowadays. And... A lot of these adventure games are sometimes just walking simulators where you walk from place to place and that's it. The, the, narrative, the narrative just comes to you in different ways. Yes. And in addition to that, there are also games that come out that, are, that you just click through. You, you just click anywhere. The, yeah. the story will unfold without any puzzles, without, without bothering the player too much. So the reason I played with my Dara Putt Putt was because it, you'd learn something at the end of the game and not just click through it. Yeah. I think the other thing that I pride myself in doing in addition to the entertainment level and the storytelling is that I've always tried to infuse my work with a sense of um, emotional growth f- for the, the character. Um, there's characters are kind to each other and there's a payoff there's um, even, even that little recycling thing that I mentioned before. It's, it's like, um, <laughs> is it too, too corny to say, is this teaching kids to be good citizens, to protect the earth, to recycle, to say please and thank you, to show enthusiasm and support as a good friend? I mean, all that stuff is in putt-putt. And did you contribute in any way to the localization process of these games? No, I did not. I was probably on to other things. <laughs> because it's interesting. Uh, the first time my daughter played But But Goes to the Moon, it was the Hebrew version. Ah, and nowadays, wonderful. she plays it in the English version to learn English. Yes. We have heard that a lot from people who have played our games, talking to them in other countries. Um, we were in DevCom uh, last August, David and I, both speaking at the conference, and many people came up to me and to David separately and said, I, I learned English as a child playing your games. We mm-hmm. hear that a lot. Yeah, it's, it's um, something we probably couldn't have imagined at the time that we created them. And you know, most of the projects you've worked on are talky games, games with voice acting. And so yeah. you can actually learn how to pronounce words because the first adventure game I played was Maniac Mansion. Uh-huh. So I'd I could write the words, I'd know their meaning, but most of the time I wouldn't know how to pronounce them. Right. And so I'd know what to click to do things on screen, but then I'd have to ask my parents how these words are pronounced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're definitely more than just games. Indeed. Yes. Still in 1993, you're credited on design theme and writing on Fetty Bear's birthday surprise. (laughs) What can you tell us about that project? Um, What I remember of Fatty Bear, well, everybody loves birthdays, and it was really fun to be writing for a different character than Putt-Putt. After two two rounds of Putt-Putt, I was happy to be um, creating a voice and a character sense for... um, a bear. <laughs> and there's a little girl in it too, isn't it? <laughs> isn't there? Yeah. I mean, the birthday I surprise mean, is for her. Yes. Pe- people might think, well, how come she doesn't know the games that she's been working on? Dude, it's like, what, 40 years? I mean, it's like. 40 I've years. Now on, I feel old. <laughs> I've worked on a lot of stuff. And, um, and this is the, the creative path 
and career that I've chosen for myself. And, um, and there, you're intensely involved in the project when you're involved in it. And then you set it off on a life of its own and people play it and enjoy it. And you're on to other things. Um, maybe my brain is limited in that way. Maybe some people remember every single aspect of every project they've ever worked on. Um, I like to kind of, uh, this is interesting. I think about um, creative real estate in my brain. And when you're in, and maybe you can relate to this as well, that when you're intensely working on something, there is no space in your brain for anything else. And then when it's done, what I find is like, new ideas start popping up. It's like, whoa, okay, that is interesting. And now I have the bandwidth and the time and the creative real estate to actually work on something new. <laughs> so um, yeah, when it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> you don't need but to I apologize. Most people don't remember the projects they've worked on. And this is one of the interesting aspects in these conversations because these games meant the world to us. Yeah. And for you guys, it was just a work day. I mean, it meant something at the time. Sure. But eventually it was work. If you'd ask me what I've done at work three years ago or four years ago, I couldn't delve into the details of whatever project I was working on. Right. So I don't expect the people I interview to remember everything. But it's always nice to hear the stories behind the games yeah. in case they do remember. <laughs> it was always fun working with Lori and it was always fun working with, with Ron. And unlike some of the other companies that I worked on where they kind of cut us as designers and interactive scripters out of the picture, Ron was never like that. And if he had a problem, something came up, he would often come back to us and say, I think, I think we need, you know, an, some more dialogue right here. Or do you have an idea of how we can connect these two things? And I took, because the, that was pretty much the first real company that I, I worked with. I assumed going forward, everybody would be that way. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, someone doesn't respect the designers? <laughs> huh, that's new. <laughs> <laughs> now in 1995 you're credited for san francisco pd homicide case ah. file the body in the bay <laughs> oh yes okay and he has a dark side yes which is a lesser known fmv game but still an fmv game That's so what really can you tell cool. us about that project a very cool game i well i certainly know the people who were involved with paul <laughs> yeah um, those people, they got, okay, Paul, Paul Drexler actually went to, went to college at the same time as my older brother and they knew each other. But I think the real connection came when, um, Paul's wife, Julie Marsh and I became friends and they knew I had this background from Sherlock Holmes. And they had a friend who was a former homicide detective with the San Francisco PD. And they had this idea that they would create a game based on real cases that the detective had, I mean, it was, they were tried and, and verdicts were, were given down and, you know, bad people went to jail and it was kind of public domain. There were court, it was court, documents. And so there was no reason why they couldn't mine them for interest, an interesting idea for a game. And so Paul and Julie got in touch with me and said, hi, Annie, would you like to work on this? I said, sounds really fun and interesting and very different from Fatty Bear's birthday surprise. You see, I like to do things that are different. <laughs> so and during the four-year gap between Sherlock Holmes and this production, both being FMV games, what changes have you noticed in the production levels, in the, the production itself, when mm. it came to the actual creation of the game? Well, well, Paul and Julie were friends, and, and I remember their company was very, very small. So I, I certainly remember going to their house in San Francisco and 
sitting at the kitchen table drinking tea and, you know, we were talking about how the game would work and what I had learned and how they could take the current technology and move it forward. So I was able to give them some insights, probably coming from David, finding, you know, it's like, hey, they've got this problem. How would you suggest they use it? And I'd be a conduit for David's knowledge. Um, but as always, my role was typically as the writer and, and um, interface designer, just so that players, like you say, you know, if you're thinking about games the, the, today, they often maybe are not as engaging for every single kind of player because they're not meant to be. <laughs> they're just like, okay, this is a walkthrough and you're collecting stuff. Or this is, this is a problem that the solution of which is only in one person's mind and that, that person is the designer and it's not intuitive at all. Um, can I can I confess something here? I have never played one of David's games from beginning to end. Does he know? He knows. <laughs> he loves me anyway. Because <laughs> it's not my thing. And um, maybe it's because I have um, a lower frustration level. But walking around, is like, I'm like, okay, what do I do now? It's like... <laughs> so... While I greatly admire the stuff that he has been a part of, it's amazing. Um, it's not my kind of entertainment. The truth is, I don't play games. <laughs> Wait, so you haven't played Putt Putt all the way through any of the Putt Putt oh, games? Oh, yeah, Putt Putt, sure. But how many decades ago was that? <laughs> I'd like to say two decades ago. But it's more Let's than Let's leave that. it at that. <laughs> but if you mention. Just Something like Sherlock Holmes or um, SFPD, Homicide, The Body by the Bay. Those are like, if I were to, I'm not really playing them. I'm listening because I want to hear my dialogue. I want to hear the part of the storytelling that I created. And, and well, that's... So, so of, they <laughs> sent you videos of playthroughs of the game. You'd sit next well, to the playtester and I watch the... These, I have all these in original boxes in my garage. Wow. We don't have a machine to play them on now. <laughs> they must but be worth millions. I guess. Every single one of them, we have, we have shelves lined with these old games. In the original wrappers. <laughs> they are yeah. worth a couple of millions. Mm, who knows? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so maybe it's surprising to people to hear that I'm not a gamer. I am not a gamer. <laughs> I'm a writer. I'm a storyteller. Well, I'm not a gamer. You may be surprised to hear, but none of the people I talk to are gamers. Most of, <gasps> even people who've worked on these games, not just, you know, you've played through the Butt Butt games, which you've worked on, but, you know, adventure game developers are usually not adventure game fans or adventure game players. Exactly. That's true of David. I mean, sure, you know, they spent 18 months working on Return from Monkey Island. And it was intense, and they made something beautiful and miraculous. But David doesn't sit around playing adventure games. He doesn't. <laughs> it's not what he chooses to spend his free time doing. Um, right now, he's making me a new website for my novel. <laughs> yeah, but he did play Zach McCracken with me on stream a couple of months ago. Oh, there you go. He loves that game. Oh. <laughs> Still in 1995, you're credited for original design on Mandolin and the Magnificent Puppet Show. So I presume it's original design because they ignored most of it? <laughs> Might be. <laughs> um, a lot of the games that came from the, um, the media departments of publishing companies wanted essentially to take a book and turn it into a game without any changes. Now, there are many, many Madeline books and um, they're classics, but to the credit of whichever company this one was, and was it, I don't know who it was, was it Creative Wonders? Um, yeah, Creative Wonders. Yeah. They wanted us, me and Lori, to come up with an original 
Madeline's story. That was so thrilling, Daniel. I mean, I I read those books when I was a little girl, and Madeline was a very feisty female character during a time where there were not. I mean, there was Pippi Longstocking, but and there was Eloise who lived in the Plaza Hotel in New York. But you know, that's three. Um, the, so to be able to carry on the legacy of Madeline into a brand new adventure. That that felt like an honor that Lori and I took really seriously in our in our way of taking things seriously. We made it super fun. <laughs> so we did that one, and we did another one. Um, Get ready for school, Charlie Brown. Yeah, there was that one. That was that was yeah. <laughs> we, I tell you, it's like everybody who had an intellectual property for kids at that time was throwing money at CD-ROMs. And, yeah, and Lori, those Lori were and I the were, multimedia and, years. Exactly. And Lori and I were like the CD ROM queens. So in 1996, you were also credited for original design for Madeline European Adventures. Oh, yeah. The European Adventures. Yeah. That was really cool. Um, part of that took place in Istanbul. And we had to do research about Turkish baths and Turkish delights and whirling dervishes. And um, that was just fun. It's just fun. And also in 1996, you're credited for Mr. Potato Head Saves Veggie Valley. I loved that game. <laughs> okay, so here is a, there was no intellectual property about Mr. Potato Head, not in a story form. It was just a toy. And I'm old enough to know that back in the day, you didn't have a plastic potato. You actually, they gave you these, these inserts, but... You had to ask mom or dad, can I have a potato to play with? And you'd stick the things into an actual potato to make the face and the hat and the mustache. <laughs> so, it would uh, be a toy with an expiry date. <laughs> yeah, it starts getting these uh, potato eyes coming out in mm -hmm. unusual places. Mr. Potato Head Saves Veggie Valley was an absolute delight to work on. And... Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I hope there are still iterations of that game around for people to play because it was it was really fun and imaginative. And you know, Mr. Potato Head never really talked. And so we got to create a character out of a potato. <laughs> and the other vegetables too. We got to create And and it's a year after Toy Story. So Mr. Potato Head talked a year prior to that. How about that? Such trendsetters. <laughs> in 1997, you're credited as a Disney consultant on Disney's animated storybook, 101 Dalmatians. Yes. Okay, that was the first in to Disney. Disney Interactive was, once again, they had a ton of intellectual property. And they said, okay, how can we cash in here on this CD-ROM thing for kids? And... Um, that was a game that never saw the light of day, but Lori and I worked on, you know, some designs and I'm sure we were paid very well. And it, it's always disappointing when something that you know would be really fun and great, just like for whatever reason, you know, the producer gets distracted or moves to a different department or leaves the company and whoever was championing the project inside a big studio like Disney isn't there anymore and someone else comes in with their pet project and there goes 101 Dalmatians. Wait, why do you think it never saw the light of day? I have no idea. It could have been any of the above reasons that, you know, it's just like you need somebody inside this big company to keep people focused on it. <laughs> so they hired us to create a design, but who knows? They never told us. It's like, you know, we're just not doing I mean, that happens. That happened more often than But not. it did see the light of day. That's why I'm asking. It saw the light of day, but not yeah. with our design. <laughs> So maybe instead of 101 Dalmatians, they ended up with like six because <laughs> it was less expensive. <laughs> All those little dogs, they need to eat. <laughs> but you're still credited on it as Disney consultant. Yes, it's true. 
We worked on it maybe for three or four months. Um, it's so funny to me how the business works. And I have no idea because I'm not a game designer anymore. Um, if that is the case anymore, but there were at least 10 projects over the years that we worked on, either me or Lori, David and I, that we put a lot of creative energy into and worked on maybe for months and wrote design docs and all this stuff. And they just said, yeah, we're not, it's not that we don't like what you're doing. <laughs> it's like, we decided we're not doing this. <laughs> okay, thanks, bye. So you can't get too attached until it actually, um, they say, okay, this thing is green lighted and um, here's when it will come to market. But then, you know, in those other cases, Daniel, when what you see is not really even close to what you designed, you know, sometimes it's maybe even better to remember the wonderful design in your head <laughs> that, you know, you can always hold on to that instead of like, what this? <laughs> can you give me any examples of projects you've no. worked on? <laughs> Okay. Um, we did, we, Lori and I did did something for Broderbund. Do you remember that company? Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, they're actually in Marin County. They they were right up the road, um, you know, a couple of exits on the freeway. Um, and we worked on one a project for the, with them. Um, it's called News Hounds. I remember it was about a bunch of kids um, who were kind of like detectives, and they were under the wing of a retired newspaper editor. And it was fun. And I think Lori and I worked on it for 18 months. <laughs> wow. And then they decided they didn't want to do it. <laughs> they canceled it after 18 months? Yeah. Those companies had so much money and they had so many projects going on at once. Like I said, if you didn't have someone championing your project in the company, showing up at all the meetings and being able to, um, advocate for the continual financing of this development of this project, then you could get snowballed. <laughs> Gone. That was a good one too. Everything we did was good. <laughs> it seems like it. So I don't understand why, you know, I understand that projects may get canceled, but after 18 months, I presume I know, that it was, it was at least 70% <laughs> done 80% yeah. done it was surprising or was 30% done or who knows you know? who knows you can't get too attached emotionally <laughs> on yep. to the next one <laughs> so on to the next one your next credit is in 2015 so what happened after 1997 what have you been working on what since? was I doing I was writing books yeah so tell us about those books. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, in 1999, ah, yes, now I remember. <laughs> in 1999, um, I got the idea to create a teen website called The Insight. That's T H E I N S I T E dot org. Like in the cool site, as also in Insightful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that website was um, financed and developed through a company that David was working for at the time called Talk City. And Talk City um, was an offshoot. It was, it was an online chat community that was an offshoot of uh, Apple Talk, I believe. And David was working with Talk City, and they had nothing of substance for teenagers. Just these like inane chat rooms where people would, you know, come in and, but nothing real. And I had this idea that maybe there could be some programming for teenagers. Now, my own kids at that time were 17 and 12. And so they were at opposite ends of a spectrum of the teenage years, really. And I was intensely interested in adolescent psychology at that time because I was living with two crazy people. 
<laughs> yeah. So um, I thought it might be really interesting to use the fact that teenagers were online to be able to give them some resources for things that were interesting to them, like sex education and learning about about drug use and abuse and and um, just relationship smarts and communication skills and um, anything that they might want to know about. I thought it would be really cool if I could not only create a website with printed information, but also have live chats on a regular basis on a schedule that would bring in experts who in the real world actually did these kind of group sessions with teenagers, but would do it online. And so I started reaching out to people who were excellent group facilitators who knew teens really well and offered them an opportunity that they had never even thought about. That is doing your thing online. <laughs> this is, oh, excuse me, this is, I, I'm, I'm two years ahead. This is 1996. This is 1996, okay. There was an overlap between uh, the end of the CD-ROM stuff and, and um, this. In 1996, I got this idea. In June of 1997, we launched the Insight. And we had, at its height, probably 30 hours of weekly programming for teens with Planned Parenthood public educators and um, tobacco cessation programs for teenagers and all kinds of really, really cool things. Um, the people who sometimes they would come to our house because they didn't have an internet connection at their own house in 1997. And wow. um, I would be on the keyboard and I would type for them and I would relay the questions from the chat room and take dictation. And it was like going in and out. I typed pretty fast. Um, and I also thought it would be a good idea if we archived the transcripts of these Q and A, because you know, you might've missed the four o'clock on Thursday Planned Parenthood talk on birth control. And you really wanted to catch what, what the questions and answers were. And so we had an archive of all the transcripts, we had the programming, and then we had the printed content. And then there was one other thing I added, which was kind of like a panic button for someone to send a question to a character that I created called Tara, T-E-R-R-A. And hey, Tara was me answering teen questions online. And from the very, very beginning with no advertising at all, I started getting email from all around the world. And when that hit, I found my calling and thought, I, I think I'm done creating games. I think I need to help teenagers in a compassionate, wise way, in a way that they would feel safe and comfortable and confident in the answers I would give them. And that started my book writing career. So tell us about the books you've released in those years. Yeah. In 1999, there's a book called um, The Teen Survival Guide to Dating and Relating. Uh, it was originally called Can You Relate? And it was based on emails and my answers to them. Um, five years later, I did a book called Too Stressed to Think, which is about stress and decision-making, also a lot of emails because I was starting to find that the kids, once they were getting online um, in greater numbers and more of their lives were happening online, that they were um, revealing a lot of anxiety and stress, but they had no tools to deal with it. And so I co-wrote that book with a woman named Ruth Kirshner, and we started doing um, workshops in schools. And then that kind of became, for me, um, a way to do public speaking on my own. I, and then there was all the stuff about mean kid behavior, uh, socially aggressive kids in schools. I don't like to use the word bullying, but that became like the key word for everything. And 
schools would call me up and they say, um, Annie, we need help. I know. Um, can you come and do a student assembly? We've got 500 sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And I would go into an auditorium or a gymnasium and the kids would be up on the, um, on the bleachers. I was traveling around the country doing this. And it was, it was very gratifying because I had been at home answering these emails in my office. And in these live assemblies, kids would raise their hand and say, you know, what do you do if? And I'd be able to just like um, tap into the emotion of that child in that moment. Everybody else would kind of like fade away. And I would be able to connect with that kid and give him or her something that they could take out of the assembly and feel more powerful in their ability to deal with whatever was going on with them at home or at school with their peers. Um, it feels like a very important kind of work. And it, and it did from the very beginning. So I started doing public speaking in 2000. That has continued and I continued writing books as well. Um, so many books. <laughs> But they were mostly nonfiction books for um, middle school kids and teenagers. Um, there's the Middle School Confidential series, which is part graphic novel and part what I talk, call smart talk life skills. Um, David turned those three books into apps. So again, David and I are working together on projects. The, um, then I did three picture books that we published ourselves through our electric eggplant media company. Um, what else have we done? Oh yeah, the girls, oh, oh, there was one book for adults called Teaching Kids to Be Good People, Progressive Parenting for the 21st Century. And um, that was very gratifying too, because my I, I had become a podcaster at that point. I was interviewing um, parenting book authors, my thought being that parents don't have a lot of time to read parenting books, but there's an awful lot of really good stuff in these books. So I'll read the books and I will interview the parenting authors and hopefully the parents will have time to listen to a podcast and get some of the takeaways because there's so much wisdom out there. Um, and after that, I decided that I would focus on girls' friendship because that's what the emails were telling me was needed. So I wrote a book called The Girls' Q&A Book on Friendship, 50 Ways to Fix a Friendship Without the Drama. And from there, and that came in in 2014, um, I partnered with the Girl Scouts of America because that's where the girls are and um, was doing that all over the San Francisco Bay Area and beyond, um, friendship, girls' friendship workshops. And every girl who signed up for the workshop got a copy of my book. And then I would do parent, parent talks to the parents of those girls, seeing how they could help the girls with their peer relationships. And everything is just kind of built on that very beginning premise that you showed in that little video from a zillion years ago, that when, you empower, ago. when you empower kids, give them tools, whether they're programming tools or social emotional learning tools, they feel more confident in their ability to move forward in the world. And I think that's what we adults ought to be doing for the young people in our lives. Indeed. And we'll get to your latest books in a moment. But first, given the fact that we've reached 2015, in 2015, you're credited as the voice of Camilla in Zach McCracken Between Time and Space. I'm sure it was a very short little piece that I said. <laughs> it wasn't lots of dialogue. <laughs> it wasn't um, lots of dialogue, but you're acting alongside David. Yes. Well, we're a good team. <laughs> okay, here we are. <laughs> yes, Camilla. We created this game in 1988. Back then, we weren't exactly having dreams more like we were being guided to do the game. It felt like we were channeling something from outside ourselves. The plot, the characters, and everything else just flowed from that inspiration. Yeah, it was scary. It was like someone, or something, was writing the story through us. 
and we just created the game in order to broadcast the message. Quite amazing to think that it was 18 years ago. You mentioned something during our last break about things that have been happening very recently. Won't you tell us about that? Well, we've been having these vivid dreams, just like the one Zach had in our game. I thought it was just me, but then I talked with Matt and... I've been having them too. David, tell her what just happened. Okay. Well, last night I had another intense dream. The aliens from our game were chasing me, just like they were before, wearing the same nose glasses and cowboy hats. But that's not the strange part. This morning my vid phone rang. I answered it and couldn't believe what I saw. Those same guys from my dream. They looked as freaked out as I was, and then they hung up. I see. Not. what's your take on this? Well, I'm not sure. Well played, Danny. <laughs> I uh, had forgotten about that. Uh, Matthew Kane is a dear friend of ours. He still is. It's fun to hear his voice. <laughs> that was that was 2015. Yeah, that was 2015. You yeah. forgot all about it. Yeah, really. <laughs> so I presume you did it in one take. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. you would have remembered. Probably, yeah. Um, I've done a lot of amateur acting, so it's probably... Here, Annie, we read this. <laughs> okay. In 2017, you were credited for playtesting Thimbleweed Park. How did you find the experience of playing a new retro point-and-click adventure game after so many years, given that I've just realized that you haven't played any <laughs> retro point-and-click adventure <laughs> games even in those years? <laughs> oh, I've been outed. Okay. <laughs> um... I'm very good at finding bugs in games, which is probably why they, David asked me if I would do it because I'm a complete novice. And so I don't, I don't play a game like a, like a gamer plays a game. I play a game like, you know, someone is sitting down like your mom, you know, and it's like, okay, why is it doing this? Why won't it let me do this? And so I really believe that as a result of my frustration in the opening sequence, he goes into the cemetery and he, he can't get mm -hmm. out. I think they changed that because <laughs> I was like saying, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Wait, so what did they change? I don't the know, fact that the character is going to walk faster? I think they made it that you couldn't go down every pathway if there was nothing there to do. Because that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> well, that's a significant change. So well, yeah. well done, Annie. That's, that's, that's why I got a credit. <laughs> You know, back in the day, you'd have to walk across several screens and, and you couldn't walk faster. With Thimbleweed Park, they added the ability to walk faster. If you double click an exit, then the characters walk. Maybe that was my run. input. <laughs> so back in the day, we, have, we had to decide whether or not it's worthwhile to go to a certain place because it would take us like several minutes of getting that character to walk right. there. So thanks for that, Annie. Well done. Sure. Anytime. <laughs> and in 2022, you got special thanks on Return to Monkey Island. When did you first learn about the project? And what was your initial reaction? Well, I'm sure I learned about it as soon as David learned about it. Like I said, we've been together for 50 years, so we don't have secrets. Um, he was very, very excited. And there's no way that I could have been as excited as he was because... I never played the original Monkey Island game, though I knew it was a big deal. <laughs> so I was carrying the secret around. You haven't played any of them? Uh-uh. <laughs> I know. Conversation <laughs> over. <laughs> hey, everybody has their own thing, right? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, he was so happy. And of course, I was so happy for him. That's what a good partnership's about. So um, maybe I got a credit because, you know, I was very understanding when he had a bug that he was working on. But I was equally a wonderful partner by saying, okay, David, we're taking a hike now. We are leaving. Stand up. <laughs> the dog is ready. I'm ready. We're going outside. <laughs> and and that's, that's appreciated too. Also, I bake. So, you know, fresh muffins, sourdough bread, you know, that kind of thing. I probably got an acknowledgement for, for that. 
for baking. Yeah, for baking. Special thanks and baking. And yeah, fats. for baking because, because, you know, programmers need to eat. <laughs> Moving on to present day, the first <laughs> conversation is being recorded on January 25th, 2024, but it will premiere on Galentine's Day, Galentine. which is celebrated on February 13th. And on that day, your new fiction YA novel, The Little Things That Kill, will be released. So first and foremost, congratulations. Thank you very much. I got this idea 10 years ago. <laughs> so um, it's been a long literary journey. So you started writing it 10 years ago? <laughs> yeah. Which or just you got the idea 10 years ago. I got the idea 10 years ago and started writing it. Which just goes to show you that you only fail when you give up. <laughs> but if you stick with something, you will get across the finish line. And, and what inspired you to make the transition from writing nonfiction to crafting your first YA fiction book? And how did the experience differ for you as an author? Ah, uh, big question. Writing fiction. I got all day. Okay, <laughs> me too. Uh, <laughs> writing fiction is a whole other thing. Um, yeah, I guess you could say that writing fiction is like what we did with Putt Putt or, you know, the original Madeline adventures that we made up. That's fiction, it's storytelling. But a novel is, um, it's a big thing. And if it's a well-written novel, it's probably as complex as the most complex adventure game ever could be. That everything that you put down in the novel has a purpose. And even the very first line needs to come to fruition at the very end. And so it's like this tightly carved inter interacting thing that you need to hold a lot of it in your head at one time. You need to know your characters really well, which is something that never occurs in nonfiction. There are no characters. <laughs> um, nonfiction, I was talking to somebody recently about this and with a nonfiction book, when you put together a proposal for a nonfiction book, either for yourself or you're trying to get a book contract, Typically, you need a table of contents. It's like, what are you covering in this nonfiction book? What, what's the subject and how are you going to build each chapter to lead into the next thing? It's essentially teaching. That's what it is. So I know how to do that and it's pretty straightforward. Um, there's nothing straightforward about writing fiction. I mean, in my experience anyway, maybe some people it was, but um, I actually found it in some ways excruciating, but also some, in some ways very beautiful on uh, another level that I've never created anything on before. Um, you're creating a fictional universe and you're populating it with characters that don't exist, but you're, the trick of it, and it's, um, it's magic, is that you know your characters so well that your reader falls into a place that is not real, but feels so real that they go along on the ride with you and they care about what happens to these characters. And they react with horror or frustration or, or sadness over the loss of something going on in the characters' lives. Um, that you've created a world that feels so real that the world you're in, the room and everything around you just disappears. It's like when you go to the movies, right? And you're watching a really good movie. You just, it's some trick of the human brain. I don't know what it is, but it's an identification with a character in a story. And the identification, if you've done it right, is so strong and so three-dimensional that you swear you're spending time with real people. So it, there's no table of contents here. <clears throat> Sometimes you just have to let the characters guide you 
which sounds a little bit weird since you're the writer, but um, that often happened with me. I would come back to the keyboard in the morning and I, what, part of what motivated me is I wanted to see what happened next. I didn't know everything that happened. <clears throat> and by putting my hands on the keyboard and starting to write the dialogue for a particular character, I would find out what happened next. And that would motivate me to keep writing more. And yes, I wasn't writing straight on for 10 years. I wrote other books in between. <clears throat> it started in 2013 and, and there were other things that I was doing in between that. The girl's friendship book happened in between there. And so there were great periods of time where I would just stop working on the little things that kill. And, um, and sometimes it, I let it gather dust and I, I couldn't imagine ever picking it up again because I, I didn't know what was going to, I didn't know if I had the, the talent or the persistence to get it across the finish line. I didn't really know where the finish line was. And so it, it became a challenge to think about it. And I, stopped thinking about it and started thinking about other things. <clears throat> but then um, the pandemic happened and the public speaking stuff went away and everything kind of shut down. And I got to ask myself, okay, I don't know how much time we have here where the world is kind of at bay. Maybe I could use this time to work on the little things that kill. And so I picked it up again and started working on it. And I found some things came easier for me that maybe I had grown and matured in my personal life in the interim, in the hiatus, that I was better able to see some of what was going on in the story in a different way. So that was gratifying. And then I saw that I had gotten to the end of a draft and realized I could not go any farther on my own. and. Um, I hired an editor and worked with her for about four months. And that was great. She actually was able to see the manuscript with fresh eyes and give me some suggestions about a roadmap. And at the end of the four months, I said, okay, I got this. Thank you. And then I started working on it again. And um, here we are. <laughs> what was your longest hiatus? <clears throat> maybe three years. But like I said, um, even when I picked it up again, Daniel, it wasn't like I was working on it full time. It's a big story. And um, I gave myself a crazy creative challenge. When I first started, I had five first person narr narrators. And that's so much to keep track of. And then one, some feedback that I got from, from the editor was because two of the five characters that I was giving first person point of view were um, adults. And she said, teenage readers don't want to read adult point of view. So why don't you lose those two? I'm like, oh, okay. So this is kind of like um, an adventure game in a way where you have someone who's going to give information so that you could solve the puzzle, but you've now gotten rid of that person. How can the in information get into the story where the reader needs it if we've gotten rid of that information giver? So yeah, I just realized, like in, in, in Maniac yeah. Mansion 2, <clears throat> Day of the Tentacle, they had five or six playable characters and they reduced it to three. Yeah. And the other ones became non-playable characters. Yeah. Um, it was torture, and I shouldn't have been doing that since it was my first novel. Why make it harder for myself? But yeah. Um, though, especially one of the two adult characters definitely had a story to tell. So I figured out a way to have other people tell his story, uh, his perspective. It was very important. Uh, so yeah, so now we are, I think, uh, maybe 19 days from, as we record this, February 13th, 
is 19 Days From Now and this book that has been germinating and gestating for this many years is about to see the light of day. And uh, we've gotten some early reviewers and early reviews on Goodreads and people are drawn into this story. And it's, wow, it's really, um, it's mind blowing. It's also gratifying that especially it's a meaningful story. It's about death and loss and um, regret and renewal. It's about forgiveness. It's about a lot of things. And I am gratified to read some of these early reviews where the readers are getting it on all these very deep levels. I've cried over some of the reviews. <laughs> But I weep easily. I'm wired to weep. <laughs> and when did you choose Galentine's Day as the release date? Well, we kind of picked it out of the hat that it would be sometime in February. We probably decided that in October. How long will it take us? You know, the book is edited. How long it will it take to do all the cover design and, and the layout of the book and choosing the fonts and getting the audio book together and all that stuff? And we said, okay, it's October now. I bet you by February we could do this, me and David, just me and David. <laughs> um, but then I, I said, okay, February when? Definitely not Valentine's Day. It's not that. Then I, I, I never heard of Valentine's Day before, <clears throat> but it is a celebration of female friendships. And at the heart of this book, it's a story about friendship. Friendship that defies all boundaries. And so I thought, this is great. Okay, February 13th, Galentine's Day. Now, nonfiction often requires a strong foundation in, in research and facts. Yeah. How did your background in nonfiction influence the way you approached the, the world building and character development in this book? 10 points for that question. That's great. Um, I understand teenage psychology. I understand girls especially and their friendship and their peer relationships. I understand how hard it is to navigate some of the turmoil that just comes with the territory of being a teenager. I also understand loss. And I think it's, I could not have written this book in my 20s. I think, I think you have to, you have to understand people on a deep level and you have to recognize that even though someone may come off as harsh and um, antagonistic, typically they are hurting underneath. They're very vulnerable. And that vulnerability is too scary to uncover. And so they come out with all guns blazing, pushing people away when really what they want more than anything is to be embraced. And so writing characters who are flawed and complex is for me the joy of this kind of writing. And, you know, it goes back to that idea of <laughs> putt-putt and wanting to infuse it with empathy and compassion and kindness when you're telling a relatively simple story. But it's the same thing here. These I've got these three girls who are telling the story from their perspective as we all tell our own story and live our lives from our own perspective. But the idea that people are not necessarily what they appear to be. Not all of it is showing. And if we can just take a little time and be a little more patient, maybe we can look inside the person who's standing in front of us, be not so quick to judge, give them a little space, some um, compassion, because you just never know what they're dealing with. And in that way, 
we're building some bridges here. We're understanding ourselves and other people better. I think that's part of what this story does. And, um, and it's got some, some parts that are really funny and some parts that are also um, scary <laughs> and very, very sad. <laughs> but it feels like um, if a book has a life and um, a wholeness to it, I, 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 feel, I feel good about this. I, I, feel, I feel good about putting it out in the world because I think that young people could benefit from reading a story like this. And maybe that's puffed up of me, I don't know. But um, I, read, I read young adult fiction a lot. And when it's done well, I just like, yes, it's so good. <laughs> I think this has a lot of crossover potential. Um, one of my reviewers was 80 years old and a guy. He said, I am not this target audience. I loved this book. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, good. It's universal. And what, yeah. Was the paranormal aspect there from the beginning? Yeah. One of the characters is a practicing witch and she's undeniably gifted. Um, and she's a loner and an outcast <laughs> because um she carries around a spell book. <laughs> and um she's not hiding the fact that she believes in a lot of stuff that nobody else believes in. She relies on it, which is also kind of interesting. The idea of being who you are, um, embracing what you embrace, but also to what degree are you using it as a crutch um, to not face some other things, to um, not count on yourself, if you can count on some supernatural powers. Um, I found that interesting to explore. And yes, it, it was always there. I figured there needed to be three very distinct characters here. And um, saying that my, my protagonist, Nicole, is dead is not a spoiler because you find that out on page one. Um, <clears throat> but her, her friend being into psychic stuff is someone who can who she can communicate with, that she needs to have that communication link. Because even though she may be dead, it's not the end for her. <laughs> In her case, there's still much more that she needs to learn. And uh, I found that pretty intriguing to explore that. Yeah. If the end isn't the end, and you can continue learning and progressing and potentially making better choices your next time around, if there's a next time around, how cool would that be? <laughs> and with three distinct first-person narrators, mm -hmm. each offering a unique perspective on Nicole's life, what methods did you incorporate in your writing process in order to keep the, the narrative cohesive and engaging? Wow, you ask such great questions. Thanks. See this door behind me? At mm -hmm. one point, I had color-coded um, index cards <laughs> that kept track of, at that point, the five characters mm -hmm. <laughs> and the storylines of all the five characters. <laughs> With three, it got a little easier. Um, but if you... If you just read the chapters that are Isabel's chapters, then um, there's a story there. And Nicole's chapters, and the third person is Cassie. And you read her chapters, and, and sometimes they appear in each other's chapters. But I think that's what's interesting is that They're so distinct that even when they're interacting, they never. It, so okay, we're we're in Annie's chapter, and Annie and Daniel are having a conversation, but Annie's the one who's narrating it. <laughs> I'm telling you what this chapter was, what this interaction was like. So it's kind of like that. Your dialogue is is being recorded in my chapter, and I'm going to tell the reader what it was like for me. 
Now you, on the other hand, after this is over, um, you've got a different perspective of what this was like for you. Um, and then you go on and do something else that has nothing to do with me and you write that. So it's kind of like that. It's the idea that these characters come together sometimes and sometimes they do stuff that has nothing to do with each other. But the overarching thing is, Nicole is dead. What happened to her? That, that is the engine that drives the whole thing. Now, in navigating the, the sensitive themes of teenage suicide and the afterlife, how did you strike the right balance between exploring heavy topics and adding hopeful moments to create a captivating and emotionally resonant story suitable for the YA audience? I can't tell you whether I've succeeded or not. I think that that jury is out whether I've hit the right balance. I hit the right balance for myself, knowing that I was ready to release the book. But you know, for some people, it it might be too heavy. For some people, you know, it might be just just right. I don't know. It's like you know, you order pizza, and for some people, the sauce is way too spicy, and some people want to you know put more spice on it. Um, I don't know. Art is very, very subjective, so I don't get too caught up in that. But I knew for myself that um, there are emotional beats in a novel. And in this novel, um, I ha started to get a sense as I was writing it um, that we need to pull back a little bit or we need to just like dive right in. Um, yeah. Uh, People are grieving. Uh, I don't want to look away from that. I, I, I want... My protagonist is dead. And her dad is distraught. Um, let's get real. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's how people... I mean, books can close. I've had enough of this. I have, I have not finished books. Have you started novels and not finished them? Mm -hmm. It wasn't your cup of tea or, you know, something rubbed you the wrong way. Or I have literally thrown books across the room. <laughs> I was like, I'm not reading this anymore <laughs> because it triggered something in me that was not comfortable and I did not want to go there. I'm like that way. With, I'm like that way with movies as well. I'm that way. Um, and David has different sensibilities when it comes to movies. I said, I don't want to watch this anymore. Um, go right ahead. I'm doing something else. <laughs> Wait, so yeah. have you ever left the theater in the middle of a movie? The Exorcist. <laughs> oh, it's always The Exorcist. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> yeah. Nope. Walked right out. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Not going there. But as far as your, your, um, your question about difficult topics, unconventional topics, death, um, supernatural, I don't know. Um, I mean, I presume you think that the, the novel strikes the right balance between these two, the heavy topics and the hopeful moments. So what, in your opinion, is the right balance? <sighs> More hopeful moments, more yeah. heavy topics, a bit of both. Um, I think novels like life um, need to give us breathing space. And if, if we aren't given breathing space, we have to take it for ourselves, which might mean closing the book and I'll come back to it later. Or if something really heavy is going on in life, I'm going for a walk. So, you know, I, that level of awareness of what you need is also thematic to the novel. It's like, do you know what you need? Do you know yourself well enough to know when you're feeling off balance? So off balance that you need to give yourself a break. This is something that when I started teaching stress management stuff to kids, this is like a key takeaway. Know yourself well enough to know when you get that uh-oh feeling. 
um, I, I need a break. I need to realign myself so that I can move forward with more confidence and um, the ability to make good choices. If I'm like all over the place, um, <clears throat> probably not the best time to make a decision, especially an important decision. So I think that's part of what the girls in this novel are feeling, that, that they at different times for very different reasons are feeling off balance. What do they do to take care of themselves in that moment? You know, some people in real life use humor. Some people use aggression and they lash out at other people. They blame other people when they're feeling insecure. Um, you know, human beings are <laughs> eternally creative when it comes to um, how they respond to stuff. And the stuff in your um, arsenal of responses may or may not be the wisest choice or the healthiest choice, but on some level it's worked for you in the past. <clears throat> I think what I want my characters to do is to examine in the moment what is working. This, this old shtick of yours, is it, is it working? Is it still working right now? And if it's not, what are your other options? And that is, that is part of what, what the book is about. What are your options? You always have options. What are your options? Now, you've chosen Maria Marquis as the voice actor who voices your audiobook. Yes. Now, I presume that you've given her special notes about the characters that aren't mentioned in the book itself. Oh my, yes. So my question is, what notes can you give a voice actor that are non-descriptive, that are, are not listed in the book, that can help her find the voice of that character? Have you had an opportunity to listen to any of the snippets from the audiobook? I have. Okay. Um, Maria has her own process, and I'm guessing that um, all audiobook narrators have their own process. She gave me a whole spreadsheet to fill out for each of the minor characters, the protagonists, and the, what she calls the side characters. Um, asking things like, if this character were an animal, what animal would he or she be? Um, what... How would you describe in adjectives the quality of their voice? Age range, um, yeah, some really specific kinds of things that she used in her process. And at first it was like, I don't know, what animal? So there was a part of me that was like um, the kid who got the assignment that she didn't want to do. <laughs> But I hung in there. I probably spent four hours on it. And as a result, I think she's doing an amazing job. I'm giving her some psychological insight into the characters. And you're right, there's stuff that is not in the book because As I see the books written in first person for each of these characters. So if I'm talking about me, I'm not going to tell and it's my thought process. I'm not thinking about what my voice sounds like, though occasionally Nicole does say um, things like that. I didn't recognize that squeak as my own voice. Um, you have to step aside and outside of yourself to get stuff like that. But Maria was um, <coughs> challenging me to look very, very deeply on on a, a vocal level <laughs> of, for these characters. Oh, another one of her questions was, <clears throat> where is this character's energy centered? One of my characters is, uh, plays the piano. So I said, you know, it's in his fingers. His energy is all in his fingers. Another character um, gets stomach aches a lot. And I thought, okay, that's, that's it. She feels it in her gut. She feels everything in her gut. So that help, helps Maria, um, you know, either hunker down or she's, this character's in her head or this character's all in her throat. Um, this character flits around like a hummingbird. Um, it gives her some insight into how to perform. I found it fascinating. I had no idea. I never did an audio book with a narrator before. 
While working on the book, what was your definition of done? How did you know that the book is ready? Because yeah, with it. novels, yeah. as opposed to, to nonfiction, you know, with nonfiction, you have a, a certain range of subjects you want to cover. Right. And then you write about them, and that's it. You can <laughs> delve into each one of them as much as you want, but that's a finite amount of, of subjects. But with a novel, it can be... 500 pages, it can be a thousand pages and you can, you know, you can take the characters on a journey that you haven't planned at the beginning, uh, uh, when you started working on the, the project, but mm -hmm. so how do you know that the book is ready? How do you know? Well, if you're not when sure, did you decide that the book was done. <clears throat> yeah. When, if you're not sure you come to the end of a, a draft, um, that's a great time to bring an editor in, let the editor help you figure out if you have explored this story as thoroughly as you might, if there are things that you could lose, if there are missing emotional beats, unanswered questions. And so um, I worked with a second editor specifically on that, that emotional read. And she gave me some wonderful insights as to um, just... Annie, this scene here, I just feel like there's one beat that you're missing here between these two characters, just one beat. And I go, okay, yeah, no, you're right, I got it. Um, I knew I was done when I got to the last sentence and I started crying and smiling. I go, okay, <laughs> this is joyful and sad and perfect. <laughs> And that all of the puzzles and the unanswered questions, not only for the overarching mystery of what happened to Nicole, but the resolution for each of these characters on their individual journeys um, was wrapped up in a satisfying way. Then I knew it was done. And so after you worked with the editor, were there any, were there only minor changes or yeah, were there much. several major changes? No, it was pretty much minor. The second editor it was pretty much minor changes. And surprising to me is how quickly I flew through that last uh, revision. I was just like, I knew exactly what she was saying. I knew exactly what I needed to do to fix it. And I don't think I worked on it for more than four days after that. It was pretty great. Considering all the procrastination and all the, I'm stuck, I need a roadmap, all that was completely gone. It's funny, weird. Now, since you've worked with several generations of teenagers over the years, how do you navigate the challenges posed by the generational gaps, considering that each generation has its own distinct characteristics and dynamics when it comes to? teenagers? Well, developmentally, teenagers are teenagers. <laughs> I don't know that that changes. Um, that's a substance of who they are. There are certain um, developmental benchmarks they hit at different times, of course, because of the individual. Um, but they're going to get there. The, the biggest thing for teenagers is to, to differentiate themselves from their parents to figure out who they are, different from their parents, and in relation to their peer group. That's kind of, where do I fit in? Outside of my family, where do I fit in with my peer group? And how do I figure out my individuality amongst my peers when it's so hard to be different? As a teenager, the last thing you want to do is be like your parents, but the last thing you want to do also is be different from your peers, <laughs> which puts you in a place of reading cues over time. You're obsessed by trying to be like the peer group. And sometimes the mask or the persona you put on is so not you. It's uncomfortable. It's exhausting to maintain that. And yet you don't have the confidence to dare to be different. And so it's a facade all day long at school, all the time, online now. See, that's the difference. Um, 
my day, didn't grow up with social media, so maybe I was posing to be like them during school. When the bell rang, I got to walk home and be on my own, with my own thoughts, without my peer group, in my phone, in my back pocket. I could just be with nature and be on my own. Um, I didn't have a phone in my room. There was a phone in the kitchen. <laughs> Couldn't have these long private conversations. It was like, and in some ways that made it easier. It made it easier because it gave me and the kids of my generation breathing room from the pressures of the peer group, something that I call peer approval addiction. <clears throat> It's not like you want them to like you. You feel like you have no choice to always be like. Right, so you're saying that teenagers nowadays are the same as we were. Developmentally, as developmentally they are. But the difference is because social media never gives them a break from their peer group, they are under way more stress to be like everybody else. And it's very sad. Now, having ventured into both fiction and nonfiction writing, do you find it easier to convey your messages through the imaginative world of fiction or in traditional nonfiction books? With nonfiction, you're not hiding the message. If the book is called the Q&A, the girls' Q&A book on friendship, 50 Ways to Fix Friendship Without the Drama, you know when you pick up that book as a young reader, you're going to get some advice about how to fix a friendship without the drama. <laughs> with, a, with a novel, you don't necessarily know what you're getting. Um, well, you read the back, and there should be a very concise synopsis of what you're getting into. But the messages and how you're going to feel when you're reading this story about these three girls or what you're going to learn or how you're going to apply it to your own life, you're going to be a changed person when you finish a really well-written novel, especially a YA novel. Because the people who write YA novels know that they want to give you something that you can grow and live with. It's not just a story. It's just like ads. The most efficient ads are not the ones that tell you up front what they're selling, yeah. as opposed to an ad that shows the product for one second and has an entirely different story throughout the ad itself. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not that I'm hiding it, but you can't reveal everything. And the other part of it, is that every reader comes to a novel with different life experiences. So different things in the novel are going to be stimulated. My dad died when I was 15. And I've always been fascinated by the afterlife as a result of that. So this idea of loss, a child, but I'm a child who's dead, um, that kind of loss is one thing. What is she losing? Because we do follow her into the afterlife. So clearly, you know, she has experienced a loss too. But there's her dad, who's still very much alive. And, and that, that idea of loss, um, like I said earlier, I couldn't have written this book earlier in my life. But I feel there's no... Obviously, there, there is no way to know what a reader is bringing, what he or she will get from this book. It's going to resonate with different life experiences every reader has. But I am convinced that um, if, you, if you are a sensitive reader and you pay attention to a synopsis, you will get a sense right away, this is for me or this is not for me. <clears throat> Sometimes books literally jump off a shelf at me and say, okay, I guess I'm supposed to read this. I don't know why. My subtitle is A Teen Friendship Afterlife Apology Tour. I thought that kind of summed up something of what I'm offering here. Because it's never too late to say you're sorry. And so it's like, hmm. I'm 16 years old. That sounds like an intriguing title to me. Sure, why not? 
or wow, I've experienced a really heavy loss. This might help me. Or I've experienced really heavy loss. I don't want to deal with it. I'm not reading this book. Whatever. You just never know. You can't. You just write the best book you can write, the most honest book you can write, and you make sure that the, <laughs> the things you can control, like the typos and <laughs> the font you've chosen and the margins so that you know things aren't cramped, and, um, and a title and a cover that gives a little bit of uh, a sense of what's inside, um, that's honest. You do that and then you just let it go and you just say, okay, um, I hope the people who need to find this book find it. And I hope the people who didn't know they needed it also find it. I did my part. Now, in the realm of computer games, your work is often one part of the collaborative process, whereas in writing books, especially fiction, you, you must embody all of the characters and handle the entire narrative. How did you navigate the difference in creative control and, and responsibility between these two mediums? I love having creative control. <laughs> I love that David and I are publishing this book, so I don't have anybody over our heads saying, no, that cover doesn't work. Or, mm, that, that subject matters, uh, you need to tone that scene down. It's wonderful. Being an indie author, it, it's wonderful. Um, and so, there's that aspect of it. The other part of it is that writing a novel is very lonely. <laughs> There is no collaboration in any of it. Um, it's just you and your characters inside your head all the time. And, um, you know, sometimes that can be nonstop. And then you think, whoa, I need a break from these characters. And that's really hard. It's hard to get a break because once you're in the writing mode, whether you're actually at the keyboard or not, your brain is still trying to figure out what happens next and how does she respond to this incident and all that other stuff. It's still working. And sometimes that's really great because you go take a hike, literally, and you're gone for three hours and you're climbing hills and you're under trees and you're having a great time. And then you come back to the keyboard and you weren't aware that you were working on the next scene. But then it flows out of your fingers so easily. It's like, wow, I guess my brain was, you know, working when I was hiking. <laughs> um, but I think it takes a certain temperament. I think it also takes a certain temperament to live with a fiction writer. Um, <laughs> David is great that way. I mean, there were times, hey, hey, stop what you're doing. You need to listen to this. <laughs> I need to read this scene to you now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> All right, I'll sit down. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I see what you've done here. Yeah, it's way different than it was before. Great work, David. <laughs> now, considering the, the contrast between writing for games, where you must account for various player choices, mm -hmm. and writing fiction with a predefined path for the main character... Do you enjoy the more structured process of crafting a specific path for a character? Or do you prefer the dynamic nature of game writing? I enjoy trusting the process of fiction writing. And the process is, it's going to come to you. <laughs> Just hang in there. Just show up with an open mind. <laughs> Do you know the idea of the muses, you know, the muses, and mm -hmm. they say, when the, muse, when the muse visits, may she find you working. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like that. And also the word museum comes from the word muse, which is a temple, a, a, a storage place where we can accumulate and admire the creative work of other people and be inspired by it. 
So this is how I feel about libraries as well. They are kind of a museum to writers. And um, in my office here, I've got all kinds of bookshelves. And um, I remember as, as a 15 year old, I got my first after school job shelving books in our public library. They call that person a page. I was a library page. And I remember just being astonished, especially when I came to a shelf in the fiction section where there were several volumes by the same author. There's all the Hemingway books, Pearl Buck. It's like, whoa, this is so inspirational that this person spent all this time, all these people spent all this time by themselves creating fictional universes, creating characters. And here the books are still in print and people are enjoying them. And maybe this book is a hundred years old and I could still open it up and dive in. Um, as a teenager, I was very inspired and motivated by being around books. And so I think that trusting the process and when the process is so open-ended, not being frightened by the fact that I don't really know what happens next. Um, I'm not on a deadline here. I'm going to just let the story tell me how it needs to be told. And I think there's wisdom in that. If you know your characters well enough, you can put your character in at the bottom of a dark staircase and follow her, <laughs> follow her. She'll let you know what's going to happen when she gets to the top, whether she's going to open the door, whether she's going to like quietly back down the staircase, whether she's going to bust through. And it's like, she'll let you know. And, and so I, I think I've definitely gotten freer about that. And um, I'm working on another novel now, which is great. <laughs> um, mainly because... When you publish a Kindle version of a novel, at the last part of your last chapter, you need to announce your next book. <laughs> really? Yeah. You have to? You don't have to, but it's a wasted opportunity if you don't. Um, I don't necessarily want to write another book in a series, but I had, see, when I parked this book during one of the hiatus periods, I started working on another novel. And wow. when I found out that I needed to kind of um, announce that second novel at, at the end of this one, I thought, okay, do I have a second novel? Mm -hmm. And I went back into my computer and found it and started reading it. And I went, damn, this is good. <laughs> so, yeah. So, when is it coming out? Next Valentine's Day? Exactly. Galentine's really? Day, Galentine's Day 2025, the new novel will be done. We'll be ready. Not done. It's got to be done several months before that to get all the other stuff together. So I think this is my life for now. Yeah. Releasing new books every Galentine's Day. Yeah. YA books and uh, YA fiction books on Galentine's Day. Yes. And maybe adult novels on Valentine's Day. Mm hmm. I don't know. I don't know about adult novels. I'm not sure. <laughs> adults are boring. I don't know that adults are boring, but um, I, I think they may. Some adults are not as open to reading different kinds of things as younger readers are. And so, well, it's you know, great to it's hear like, that yeah, teenagers nowadays actually read books. Well, they may listen to books. That's why we're doing the audio book. I'm not really sure. Um, you know, on TikTok, where David and I have established a presence for me, um, there are book talkers who seem to live and breathe books. And their whole stream of videos is all about reviewing books. And these are some of the people that we, we tapped into to get early reviews for my book. They are a wonderful, wonderful community of avid readers. And so they were very welcoming and warm and um, just really lovely people. So um, I, some people are reading books. 
Now, before we conclude our conversation, I have a few questions from our viewers. Okay. Ramon Wilhelm asks, what was the best feedback you received from children, teenagers, or young adults after helping them? I've gotten a lot of very wonderful feedback from people that warms my heart. I've gotten emails from kids who reached out to me 10 and 15 years ago that start, you probably don't remember me, Annie, but I wrote to you and I was, you know, and now I have, um, I, I just, I never thanked you. Um, that was a really hard time in my life. My parents had just gotten divorced and um, my, my cousin had written to you once and said that you gave good advice, so I wrote to you and you were so nice and you really helped me and thank you so much. And I was like, oh, I'm crying, I'm crying. It's like, you know, 15 years later, someone says, thank you. Um, what, what you said to me meant something to me at a difficult time. That doesn't get any better than that for me. Anna from the Classic Gamers Guild podcast asks, what are your thoughts on the current trends in video games, especially regarding their educational potential and impact on young players? Well, since I've already outed myself as not being a game player, I really can't speak with any authority about the current games. Though, um, in preparation for a talk that I gave at DevCom last August, I did dive into some games that I thought were doing a really good job of um, helping kids develop certain insights and perspective, uh, expand their perspective on the world. Uh, now I'm going to have to remember what the name of this is. One book, it, 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 was, it was like a story. Gee, if you had told me I was going to be asked this, I would have had the notes of it. But um, it's probably a really, really popular game. And it was essentially an unfolding visual universe where um, I was called like The Secrets of Edith. I can't remember. But the Remains of, of Edith. Yes, the remains. Yes. Yeah. Um, that was fascinating to me. It was, it was a, a visual story and it was based on her journal and you found clues and it was this big house. And every time she went into one of the rooms that was boarded up, she got a backstory of one of the characters that lived there decades mm -hmm. ago. Do you know that? Do you know that one? Yeah, we played it last year. Okay. Did you, did you like it? I really loved it. Yes. Okay. What remains of Edith Finch and I and I didn't know what to expect. Yes. This is a game that, you know, like we talked before, games nowadays don't have too much interactivity or too many obstacles or too many puzzles. They are just walking simulators. You walk from room to room and the narrative comes to you. And this is one of them. So I was hesitant at first. But the narrative was really captivating, and it was a great game. I agree. If you can call that a game, yeah, I, I wonder if you could call it a game. I, I it's so how apparently you nowadays you can call anything a game. So it was a great game. How do you define entertainment? So th that's the thing. Back in the '90s, when they started making those FMV games, then the classic adventure game players would complain that they lose a lot of the interactivity because with classic adventure games, you could explore anything. But with FMV games, you can't film every interaction because it's very expensive and you have size limitations on, on the then media, which was CD-ROMs. And, and so they felt like FMV games were dumbing down the adventure game genre because you have less interactivity. But nowadays... It seems like those games that seem less interactive at the time are more interactive than what we're getting nowadays. At first, we thought that TV would try to catch up to computer games in terms of interactivity. 
But what happened was that computer games got less interactive. And so when Netflix recently released their Black Mirror episode, which was an interactive episode where you had two choices every couple of minutes that would take the story in different directions, then it seemed more interactive than games that are released nowadays. So I think that everything that requires you to click at least once on screen is considered a game nowadays. <laughs> what I loved about Edith Finch was the exploratory nature of it. And um, yeah, it's the difference between that and a novel, for example, I'm... <laughs> You're going to read my novel in sequence. <laughs> page 48 is going to come before page 47. <laughs> and I am the game master in a way. You know, I'm guiding you. You don't, you don't get to go um, anywhere else but where I'm leading you. Um, and so I found Edith Finch very much like a novel in that way, but with so many nooks and crannies to explore at at your own leisure. So um, I found it charming and um, intriguing, and it made me, I wonder if anybody would like write a novel based on that. I mean, that that's the source material. What do you think? <laughs> sure. It actually would make a great novel. Back in the day, they'd have novelizations of point and click adventure games. For example, the dig had a novelization of the game. So they take out the interactive parts or the puzzles and they just leave the, the cutscenes and whatever action was required to bring that character to that cutscene in the book. But again, given the fact that there is no interactivity or no actual obstacle or puzzle or gameplay, then you could just write whatever is happening in the game and it would make a great novel. Yeah. The writing was wonderful, and the art direction really got me. So, did you play this game all the way through? Yes, I did. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> well, I was doing research because I, I needed to um, review it for this DevCom talk, and I wanted to you know, say that I had finished it. All right, you're lucky because this game, you can finish this game in one sitting, so. Yes. <laughs> you probably did. <laughs> I did. Ramon Wilhelm asks, what is your personal favorite computer game that you have worked on? <laughs> um, I'd say Pipe Pipe Goes to the Moon. <laughs> Great choice. My, my daughter would agree. Okay. And one last question from me. What are your plans for 2024 and how can people stay in touch with you and your work? Okay. Well, right now, David is working on a new website for me, which will probably be uh, AnnieFox.com. <laughs> so, and my, and my plans for 2024? <laughs> um, I'm working to strengthen democracy in America. Okay. How are you doing that? I'm, I'm part of a group called uh, indivisible.org, and um, we've got a local chapter here. So we're reaching out to um, registered voters who don't vote as frequently as they need to, to get them out to vote for the November election to reelect President Biden. That's part of what I'm doing. Um, other plans, as I said, is to uh, work on this second novel. Can I tell you the name of it? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> it's called Lita Simtar, A Life on Two Planets, The Unauthorized Biography. Wow. No. <laughs> I love your taglines. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Lita would not approve of this biography, <laughs> but yeah, a life on two planets. I guess I like to write about loners and outcasts. Um, I just thought of, I thought of one other thing for 2024. 
Um, I would like to travel abroad again. We, David and I did a lot of wonderful traveling um, last year, and um, I just find international travel to be, I hate to use the word educational, <laughs> but um, it, it's so expansive for one's heart, one's mind, one's creativity. Um, yeah, I just would love to travel. So hopefully we will get to do that. It is our 50th wedding anniversary this year. And so- Congratulations. Um, thank you. I think uh, rather than a party, I'd just like to go on another really cool trip. Yeah, this is the the world is an interesting place to me, and um, I think there's so many similarities that flow through all of us as we take this human journey. Um, that it's always a very wonderful thing to connect with people who seemingly appear. Um, to live a different life, but um, underneath it all, yeah, we're all just people. <laughs> Indeed, we are. We are. Well, thank you, Annie, for taking the time to join me for a conversation today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Daniel. I really appreciated your inviting me, and also, um, this has been delightful.